This is part of a whole program, a holistic program, to help you understand how you can change your lifestyle, find new hope, new understanding, newness in relationship, and a new future. In our little booklet, Understanding Addiction, Recovery and Prevention, on the cover are six figures. The first figure is pain. The next is pleasure, the next is power, the next shame, the next purpose, and the next peace, serenity. Pain, said Gautama the Buddha, is basic to all life. Birth is pain, growth is pain, death is pain. We all know about pain. He wrote of it in a situation about people's pain. They were subject to the Brahmin priests of Hinduism who demanded offerings, sacrifice, money, everything for everything, and people were enslaved and behold until the Brahmin priests. And under the Boa tree, Gautama was enlightened. If we eliminate desire, there won't be any pain. It's desire that causes pain. Wanting, having, not being able to keep. It's desire that awakens pain and sustains pain and keeps it. And so the Buddha said, eliminate pain. How do we eliminate pain? Eliminate desire, eliminate wanting. Eliminate dreaming, eliminate lust. How do we eliminate lust? The Buddha said, by the Noble Eightfold Path. That's the fourth noble truth. Finding right thinking, right understanding, right livelihood, right attitude, right meditation. And so people said, yeah, the Brahmin Hindu priests didn't like it much. And they ridiculed him. But he was the healer who brought healing to thousands and thousands of people. We used to feel that Asian people had little mental illness, particularly those from Buddhist communities. But increasingly we're discovering that depression is an illness that's very real among many of these people, as it is in the West. And when we look at that, we discover that Buddhism is a means of systematized desire, a, a systematized denial, systematizing Denial, there's nothing wrong. If I believe there's nothing wrong, there's nothing wrong. And so by right thinking and systematizing my thinking, I haven't got to be subject to my desire and my want. But Freud came along and said, people live for pleasure, almost 2,000 years after. It's by impulse and pleasure the searching for pleasure. And if we understand our inner thinking, we'll find new peace and new understanding and new ease. And the basis is understanding pleasure. One of his disciples was Albert Adler, who said, no, it's not by pleasure, it's by power. Little Albert said, I remember the doctor visiting our family home. I was a very, very sickly child. And I remember the doctor saying to my father, your boy may not live till morning. I overheard him say that. I then decided to get well and become a doctor to help sick people. And so Adler incorporated that decision in his learning and understanding and growth. And his type of psychiatry has been helpful to many. It's thought of highly in the United States, particularly. And so, pain, yes, pleasure, will to power. But if pleasure and power don't work, what have you got left? Christmas dinner may just be indigestion. And when the grand final's over, and all the party's over, what have you got left from power and fame? Quite often, people have very, very little. And many of the people I see are world champ have been world champions, but are living in despair and hopelessness and wonder why. So power isn't an answer in itself. If pleasure and power don't work, we're left with shame 
emptiness. And shame so often is recognized as a particularly incapacitating negative emotion, feelings of powerlessness, self-consciousness. Do people know what I am? Do they know how I feel inside? Oh yes, we assure ourselves they do. Involving feelings of deficiencies, my inner deficiency, my perfectionism is constantly reminding me of what I lack. And so we put ourselves down and fail to live to our potential. Shame, frequently objectivized, uh, uh, pictured objectively in the Old Testament as a curse from God. When life disintegrates, hopelessness, helplessness. And if the Jew wanted to bring some sort of disappointment to a neighbour, he'd wish on him shame, disintegration, brokenness, emptiness, failure, loss of fortune, as Job experienced with the loss of family and all the curses that came on him. But Job was consistent and said, I know that my Redeemer lives. And Job came through to experience peace, shalom, harmony. He said, ah, I'd heard with my ear about this, but now my eye sees it. I experience it, I understand it. And so shame is meant to reveal, to conceal, but to disclose that we understand ourselves more truly and with greater insight. It's meant to bring us to greater joy in the long run. But so often it doesn't. It brings us to what seems like our destination and destiny. Learned helplessness, hopelessness, fear and despair. History's been like that. It was a king who employed the greatest team of wise men that the world had ever seen. And the king wanted to be wise like his wise men. So he ordered them to write a book of their wisdom. And they thought, this will be a big job. And they went away and wrote and wrote and wrote and wrote and the king had almost forgotten his orders but then he remembered well they'd better hurry up they'd better hurry up he said where's the book of wisdom and they brought volumes and volumes and he said i'm too old my eyes are too dim i can't read it go away and make it shorter write it bigger so they went away and shortened it and he said, where's my volume of wisdom? I want to read it. They brought a great big volume. And he said, the king said, too big for me. Won't have time to read it. So the wise men went away and wrote one sentence. Men are born, they cry, they laugh, and they die. We forget that whatever changes in life, they're the realities we face. And so pain, pleasure, power, shame. When power and pleasure fail us, shame is born. The shame of being imprisoned is what Viktor Frankl knew as he was taken from his German family, from his safe, secure family where he was a university student writing a doctoral thesis and Hitler put him in prison. In prison his coat was taken. As he went to Le Shower, the other side of Le Shower, he picked up another coat and in the coat lining he felt where he'd sealed his own doctrinal thesis, what's in this coat? And he took out the Shema Israel. Someone had sewn in the coat a piece of the scripture. The Lord thy God is one, and thou shalt love God with, with your soul, body, and mind, and your neighbor as yourself. About 20 verses of the Old Testament. And Frankel said, that changed my life. When he was released from the concentration camp in which soldiers released people just 60 years ago, we remember it this year, 2005, he began to write. 
the will to meaning. From death camp to existentialism and developed logotherapy, meaning therapy. And Viktor Frankl said, without a purpose, people perish. I saw it again and again in prison. People without a purpose or had lived out their purpose died. But those who had an adequate purpose never ceased to be human and fair and encouraging and brave and strong. But when the war was over, some went to their home they'd dreamed about and forgotten their purpose. They too despaired and often died. Their purpose wasn't big enough. Frankel said, a purpose that's big enough is to know that we all, we all will stand before our Creator. And in the end, we answer to Him. Purpose. I was visiting prison the other night. A lady was there who had been in a Middle Eastern jail. Her account had been pilfered by hotel staff. Pin number had been taken. And she had no personal money left to pay her hotel bill and they put her in a Middle Eastern prison. And there she was in utter despair. She said, I was in despair until I asked myself, what's my reason for being here? She said, I'm going to get out. I know people will care for me. The embassy will come and people have money to help me. But she said, there are people who've been here five years, ten years and have no hope of getting out. My purpose is to help some of them get out. In the brief time I've been home, I've helped some of them get out. Phone call is all it took. And so when she found a purpose, the experience of her imprisonment changed. And so purpose is one of those things we need if we're going to live successfully. Purpose is one of those things shame will take from us. Shame will take the present and make it a final destination. Even if we failed in the past, we'll forget that failure is a siding. It's not a destination. It's a time to pause. Sometimes it's a time for a photo shot. Failure. Time to pause, said Henry Ford, and do things more intelligently. A time to go on and to gain a new vision and to experience all the past and build it into something new. But peace, said Jesus, that's the goal. Peace I leave with you, peace that the world cannot give. In the Sermon on the Mount, we see Jesus going through the countryside, preaching in synagogues, healing people, and they followed him from everywhere. The great healer, the great healer, the great healer. And when you consider how revolutionary the message was, no wonder. It was revolutionary. In those days, the priests, the Levites, the temple officials, government officials, were all the important people, landowners, wealthy people. They could pay their tithes in the temple and the synagogue. The poor people couldn't. You had to pay tithes to be respectable. The poor people couldn't be respectable. They were condemned to disrespect, dishonour. They were condemned to despair and hopelessness. They were condemned to contemptibility, not renown. But Jesus gathered them and they looked up to him as he preached and he said, the poor in spirit, there they were before him, the poor in spirit, exhausted everything they knew how to do, no way out, not necessarily poverty stricken, the poor in spirit, blessed, the kingdom of God belongs to them. Those who mourn, blessed, they'll be comforted. The meek, the God-tamed and God-disciplined people like Viktor Frankl, blessed, 
they'll inherit the earth. Those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, blessed, they'll be filled. Those who are merciful, blessed, they'll obtain mercy. The pure in heart, blessed, they will see God. The peacemakers, blessed, they will be called the children of God. Those who are persecuted because they've changed their situation, because of right relationship that they've discovered, because of new insight they've discovered, they'll be persecuted and criticized. They won't go back to the old way of living. They'll be criticized, Jesus said. Blessed, rejoice and be glad. Your reward in heaven is great. That is how the prophets before you were treated. You're among the new prophets. You don't light a candle and put it under a bed or under an instrument of trade like a bushel, a measure of trade. You put it on the mountaintop. You, the, those who mourn, the meek, the hungry for righteousness, the merciful, the pure in heart, the peacemakers, you'll be persecuted. Yes, but blessed indeed, you'll rise beyond whatever said. You're the new prophets of the future age. And so we forget that shame is the opposite of the blessing. Shalom. Wholeness, well-being, harmony. Shalom, like a jazz symphony. And as we look at the blessing of God, makarios was the word used in translating Jesus' word into Greek, like Cyprus, a blessed island, self-contained, self-sufficient, everything that was required, blessed. Those in need will become sufficient because of God's grace and mercy and forgiveness.